on a hot October night. An Australian adventure takes a sudden and terrifying turn. When seven unsuspecting tourists enter dangerous waters and a moonlight swim turns into a desperate search for a missing friend. How could a holiday end so suddenly and so violently? What are the clues? Where will the answers be found? Solving this mystery requires two teams of behavioral and forensic experts. These seasoned detectives will reopen the scene and uncover evidence that will shed new light on the tragic incident. They will reveal who is the hunter and who is the hunted. A full moon rises over the outback in northern Australia. 10.30 p.m. A group of backpackers is enjoying a refreshing dip in an idyllic waterhole. Their laughter echoes out across the surface of the water. When suddenly, one of the swimmers disappears below the surface of the water. Who or what is responsible? And will the missing friend ever be found? Some of the answers will emerge only months later in a Darwin courtroom. The backpackers are swimming at night in the middle of one of the most remote and untamed places on Earth, Kakadu National Park, a five million acre wilderness reserve on the northern tip of Australia. The young travelers are part of a tour group consisting of five British men, two Dutch cousins, and two German sisters, Valerie and Isabel von Jordan. They are all here to enjoy the natural wonders of the Australian wilderness. Kakadu was awesome. This place was just like a different planet almost, like just with the scenery, it was breathtaking. It was a place like no other. But for the von Jordan sisters, the natural world provides a special refuge from violence. Just 10 days earlier, they have had a narrow brush with death in Bali, Indonesia. A terrorist bomb rips through a Bali discotheque crowded with foreign backpackers. It's a club the sisters had visited just two days before. More than 200 young people are killed, most of them foreigners. From my understanding, it's um, uh, Isabel and her sister had come to Darwin as a direct result of the bomb. It had gone from a holiday paradise into just like a nightmare. But their troubles have just begun. Once safely in Darwin, they start asking around about trips to Kakadu National Park and sign on with Gondwana Tours, a company that caters to backpackers. Leading the group is a 46-year-old Australian 
named Glenn Robles. Something else. season. The tour guide seems eager to show the young people a good time. We just wanted to just experience as much as we could within the four-day trip. We didn't want to be held back from much, and we wanted to see and do everything. One night, the young people decide to go for a late-night swim in a water hole, a short distance from their campsite. Approximately 30 minutes later, one of the tourists is missing. In one of the most baffling and disturbing incidents ever to strike the Australian outback. Get out, go! Get out! Get out of the water! It was a beautiful spot, though. Oh, it's lovely, yeah. There like I said, go. this time of day, it's great. Chief Ranger Greg Ryan People has been at Kakadu National Park for 22 for years. He was one of the first to respond to the scene the night of the disappearance. Charlie Manolis is a scientist with Wildlife Management International. So where are we heading now, Greg? Down the Sandy Billabong. Yep. This is exactly the route that the tour group took to the water. They passed this tree. And, and were they all, all together, the group? Had they come down uh, as a they group? They were all together, yep. There was a total of uh, 10 people in the group. Yeah. Two members of the group didn't enter the water. They stayed out here. They lit a fire. Uh, one person was playing a didgeridoo. So there would have been a would have been a fair bit of talking, presumably, <coughs> and yeah, like most tour groups, everyone having a good time. Yeah, they were in um, high spirits. Around about 10:30 uh, at night, okay, they so actually it was late. arrived at the beach. Excellent. Yes, it was late. No, no, well, it would be pretty inviting that time of year. It'd be hot and sweaty. That looks so good, doesn't it? Seven members of the group entered the water here. Two or three stayed on the water's edge. The other members of the group moved further out into the billabong. Yeah. We was all swimming in the water for about five and ten minutes. Well, we was all enjoying ourselves, we were splashing, making, like, creating a lot of noise. And it seemed perfectly safe, it was not a problem. It was only a few metres from the shore. Everyone was happy, everyone was enjoying it. It was a really good night. The tourists swim gratefully in the night air. Some start pulling others under the water. People were swimming underwater, um, going up to like someone else in the group and grabbing their legs and pulling them underwater. And then everyone would come up laughing and we, we were just larking around like, like people do in the water. There was three people swimming about 10 metres from the shore. Myself and another member of the group were probably about four metres from the shore. And then that is when it happened. I was watching three members of the group and suddenly Izzy just disappeared. She just disappeared under the water. Isabel von Jordan vanishes. At first, the others are confused about what exactly is happening. The whole incident took place in like probably like a second. It was just very quick, but for me it was like in slow motion. Is it possible she has suffered a cramp and just gone under? <laughs> Not likely. Humans struggling in calm water typically have enough time to shout for help. Witnesses at this scene recall no cry for aid. All I remember is 
I remember that one minute that she was there, and then all of a sudden she was gone. And there was like a sound of a deep thudding sort of splash. And uh, yeah, she was gone. Some believe it is part of the game they were playing. I, I thought he was playing a joke. Didn't really think much of it. But this time, it is no joke. After about 10 seconds, she still hadn't surfaced. 20 seconds, she still hadn't surfaced. James Rothwell is the first to sound the alarm. I realised then what had happened. That's when I was like, everyone just needs to get out. Within 30 seconds of the disappearance, everyone is on shore, except for one. Easy. So we all sort of come together and started shining a torch on top of the water to see if we could see any sign of Izzy. Izzy! Yeah, me too. People were shouting her name, but there was no sign of her. Izzy! What has happened to Isabel von Jordan? It isn't long before flashlight beams reveal a terrifying clue. When Isabel von Jordan disappears below the water, the two swimmers closest to her have a chilling idea of what has happened. I remember feeling something hit my leg, and it hit my leg hard. And then I came up, and there was just me and Isabel's sister. And she looked at me, and she's asked me, where's Izzy? It was like a shiver down my spine, because then you suddenly realize what's happened. Once out of the water, they shine a light looking for their friend and spot something else. Something disturbing. The glowing red eyes of one of nature's most fearsome predators. Not long ago, crocodiles were scarce in Australia. But in the 1970s, the country passed laws protecting them and today, there are an estimated 80,000 living in the Northern Territory. Kakadu National Park, where the backpackers were swimming, is famous for its crocodiles. The crocs of Kakadu are big business. Tourists from all over the world travel here for a chance to see the predator in its natural environment. But attacks on humans have been remarkably rare. Accounts of the few that have occurred are told repeatedly on tourist boats that cruise the waters in and around Kakadu. The horrifying story of Val Plumwood is one of the most popular. Uh, one of the more Horrific attacks I've ever heard of, folks, and read about is a woman out here in the, the East Alligator River out in Kakadu National Park. Went canoeing up and down the river. And uh, well, she was canoeing along, and a large crocodile came up and started bumping the side of the canoe. Afraid that the crocodile will capsize the canoe, Plumwood decides to try something desperate. She stands up in the canoe and leaps for a tree branch. This is probably a mistake. Crocodiles are excellent jumpers. They use their powerful tails to thrust themselves out of the water. Some can leap the entire length of their bodies. They do this for one purpose to capture food. Uh, 
I leapt, and as I almost in mid-leap, it came up out of the water and got me in mid-leap right between the legs. My initial feeling was one of disbelief. You know, this couldn't be happening, it was a dream. It was, it was just a flash. A flash of teeth and water <laughs> that pulled me down under the water and spun me around in this to be a death roll. It pushes the water into your lungs. I really felt like I was being drowned. The death roll is a crocodilian signature killing technique. It's used to confuse prey, to neutralize resistance, and to aid in the croc's ultimate goal, to drown the victim. The animal that grips Val Plumwood in its jaws quickly spins her into two separate death rolls. But suddenly, they stop. Crocodiles are capable of rapid bursts of energy, but the huge predators have one weakness. They tire quickly. Lactic acid, the chemical that causes cramps in human muscles, floods a crocodilian's bloodstream following a power surge. Muscles freeze, forcing the giant reptiles to rest while oxygen returns to their system. This respite allows Plumwood to get away, but only for a moment. And I pulled myself away and it, uh, it came and got me again around the thigh. Val Plumwood endures a third death roll in the jaws of a crocodile. But suddenly, the croc tires again and must rest. Plumwood has one more chance to escape. Instinctively, without thinking, I realised I could climb the mud bank by jamming my fingers in the mud and scrabbling with my feet. And I did that and I got to the top and stood up. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought I was virtually certain to die. Val Plumwood's severe leg injuries keep her in the hospital for weeks. Her story is proof that in certain rare cases, an attack is not always a death sentence. But why couldn't the crocodile complete its kill? Plumwood had two things in her favor. One of them was the size of the crocodile. The crocodile that attacked her was estimated to be nine feet long, half the size of a fully grown male. In the 15 years between the attack on Val Plumwood and Isabel Von Jordan's disappearance, the crocodiles in Kakadu continue to grow larger. And then there is the scene of the attack itself. Plumwood's life was spared in part by the shallowness of the water. The water wasn't deep enough for it to hold me under. So if the water had been even a foot deeper, I think it would have been able to drown me. For those reviewing the Von Jordan incident, the depth of the water is a key consideration. Let's go and have a look where it happened, Mike. Right. Righto, I'm cutting. Okay, cut your motor. Okay, well let's just see exactly how deep this is here, Mike. My guess is that it falls off very, very rapidly from the side there. Okay, we're on bottom there. Okay, we're about five and a half metres here, but this must just go straight off. Yep. Yep. And without a doubt, he would have been able to cruise straight through there, mm. unseen. Mm. They wouldn't have even known that he was there. Water 20 feet deep, as it is in the billabong, where the tourists were swimming, is ideal for big crocodiles. They submerge by expelling air from their lungs. 
shifting their internal organs and letting their weight take them down. Here, they move unseen and unheard by potential prey. By tucking their legs and whipping their tails, they can motor teeth first through the water at speeds approaching nine miles per hour. The fastest human swimmer tops out at five. There is perhaps no more dangerous place to be in Kakadu National Park than treading water in a deep, dark billabong. But that's where this group finds itself on a hot October night. And when it's all over, one of the swimmers will be convicted of a crime. For me, a big attraction of Kakadu was the fact that I was going to see saltwater crocodiles. It was part of the selling point of the, the trip. People go to Kakadu, they want to see the crocodiles. Over the course of their doomed holiday, the backpackers are exposed to the harsh Kakadu climate and tempted by its wild beauty. It is late October, the hottest days just before the rainy season. Every day, temperatures are up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. We've done a lot of walking, a lot of hiking, a lot of trekking through like the rough terrain, through the rocks, a lot of rock climbing up to, to the top of the waterfalls. Um, we went in a couple of caves. Every day, the group ventures into something many in crocodile country would avoid. Yeah, the trip was four days and three nights, and we was basically swimming most days, sometimes twice a day, depending on what location we were at at the time. So how is it possible that the young people would go swimming in a land swarming with saltwater crocodiles. Especially when there are warning signs all over the park. But a closer look reveals a clue. Different signs say different things. Some signs state flatly that crocodiles are in the water. These posters read, do not enter the water. But in a few locations, where crocodiles are monitored and removed by the park rangers, the warning signs say there is a possibility of crocs. Visitors can swim at their own risk. On the third and last night of the trip, the idea of swimming comes up once again. After a hard day of hiking, Glenn Robles brings the group to a popular campground called Sandy Billabong. <laughs> As usual, the group relaxes around the campfire. The night is extremely hot. On the last night, we was camped up at Sandy Billabong, and we had just finished eating dinner together and a member of the group asked the guide if we could have a freshen up because we was very dirty, tired, very hot. There was a didgeridoo there, I think it was Glenn's our guide, on which people was trying to play unsuccessfully though. <laughs> on that particular night, no one was really drinking. I think I and another member of the group were drinking, but I had the most of two little cans of beer. The night was always very hot, sweaty, we was always dirty. So there was always dirt getting into our skin, it, it was uncomfortable. 
A shallow expanse of water is located just yards from the camp. But Glenn Robles tells the group that water is unsafe. So it wouldn't be safe for us to go there because he believed that there was crocodiles in that water. But Robles has another idea about a place called Sandy Beach. The tourists decide to go. As they make their way down the dirt road, they pass at least two signs warning of crocodiles. But no one is paying attention. The setting there, it was very dark. It, it was very eerie. A single flashlight beam scans the billabong, looking for eyeshine. Eyeshine is a signal that a crocodile is in the water. Crocodilians have a special crystal layer at the back of their eye that acts like a mirror. It creates a reflective eyeshine that can be seen for hundreds of yards. This water passes the test. No crocodiles in what appears to be an ideal place to swim. The first impressions of the Billabong was that it was a, a small stretch of water. I didn't think it, it carried on very far. For me, it was a, a swimming hole. I could see the other side of it. Um, it, it just looked like, a, from what I remember, it was a small place. Billabong meant nothing to me. But had the young people known about billabongs, they may have reconsidered. A billabong is actually a section of a stream deep enough to hold water year round. In the wet season, Rivers overflow their banks and fill the floodplains. Crocodiles are free to travel through an endless network of interconnected waterways. But in the dry season, rivers and streams evaporate, and the crocodiles retreat back into the billabongs. Sandy Billabong may have looked small that night. But just past the beach area, out of sight to the tourists, the waterway turns and opens up into nearly two miles of prime crocodile habitat. But with no crocodiles in sight, they take the plunge. It seems a perfect ending to a perfect trip. Things are going so well, Glenn Robles drives back to the campground to encourage another group to join the late night swim. When he returns, everything will have changed. Their tour guide gone, the seven backpackers continue to play in the billabong. Meanwhile, something is closing in, unseen and unheard. A 14-foot saltwater crocodile the tourists may be blinded by the dark, but this fearsome predator is not. Crocodile expert Greg Erickson and emergency medical doctor Brendan Furlong review the tools crocodiles use to navigate through the moonlight. So, Greg, I understand Mrs. Van Jordan was attacked at night. How would a, how would a crocodile attack? 
Well, what happened in this particular situation is they drove up in a Jeep. Jeeps make noises and these animals have excellent uh, hearing um, out of water. What they do is as, as they come to the surface, their, their nose is out, their eyes are out, but also their ears. And they have excellent hearing. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that this animal heard that Jeep come up mm -hmm. and probably got excited. Here's an opportunity potentially to see some prey. They had a campfire, you know, partying, these, sort, these sorts of things, making lots of uh, airborne noises. And this animal was, was well aware that they were in the area. Once the group was in the water, there would have been another signal sent to the crocodile. The ripples in the water. Crocodilians have a unique way of picking up these signals through small bumps on their snouts, known as dome pressure receptors. Experiments conducted by Dr. Daphne Soares at the University of Maryland have shown how crocodilians respond to vibrations in the water, even in total darkness. There are little receptors that uh, are in the skin here called dome pressure receptors. And when a mechanical wave, in this case, uh, you know, a splashing in the water uh, hits those, uh, it sends a signal down the trigeminal nerve, you know, which is sensed by the brain. And it tells the crocodilian that there is uh, a, something splashing in the water, probably a prey item, either to the left or right. And uh, then they can turn and direct their attack at it. And so what would that be like with eight people? swimming in the water. I think that's going to be a crocodile magnet. Airborne sounds and vibrations in the water attract the crocodile to the location. Once there, its extraordinary night vision takes over. Crocodile's eyes are set close together and oriented towards the front. Left and right eye fields of perception overlap, giving it binocular vision. A crocodile can gauge distance from afar, sink below the surface. Then, like a submarine missile, launch itself towards its target. Didn't hear anything, didn't see anything. It just happened from below. Didn't see anything on the surface at all. Once out of the water, they shine a light and see the danger sign they hadn't seen before. I believe this was a second crocodile. He was in that space of water. And then everyone just realized just what sort of position we were in. One of the group runs off to find the guide. He then just started to scan the surface of the water looking for a croc. And then by then it was too late, he was gone. You could see that he was just going into a, a state of shock, but there was, by that time, there was nothing that could be done by anybody. But where has the crocodile taken her? And could she have survived? Park ranger Gary Linder, Kakadu's top crocodile hunter, is on the scene two hours later. He sets off across the billabong in pursuit of the crocodile and Isabel von Jordan. As his beam scans the surface of the water, eye shine from several different crocodiles pops up from the darkness. But these are younger crocodiles, 
unlikely to take a human. But then... We travel for a little bit and then bang, up the eastern end, brilliant big eye shine, which was telling me this is something big. The boat drift towards the eyes that lie waiting under a pandanus tree. And the croc was sitting there and then just reality struck. I just saw uh, a body in the crocodile's mouth and um, it was held by the arm and for me time stood still. I just, I'd never seen anything like that before and I'll never forget it. Lindner and his colleagues have found the croc and the body. Now, they must figure out a way to bring both back. For a second or two, I was just stunned, you know? And then he just submerged and he swam back under the boat. The croc was making his escape with the body. The size of the animal and the depth of the water left Isabel von Jordan totally defenseless. Ranger Gary Lindner now begins the most urgent hunt of his life, chasing the crocodile in a two mile long billabong. A 14 foot saltwater crocodile has seized Isabel von Jordan, a 23 year old German tourist, and disappeared with her under the water. And then he just went deep. Um, and then went straight to the bottom. The croc drags the boat for over 100 yards. Along the way, Lindner manages to get two more harpoons into the animal's back. By now, the croc has been underwater for a very long time. By the time the reptile starts to rise to the surface, one hour and 18 minutes have passed. His snout come up and you can almost hear this whoosh, you know, this, um, this crocodile wanting to get air. And I always remember that. It was just a sudden yeah, gasp, someone gasping for air desperately. It's the last breath, this crocodile will ever take. A shot rings out across the billabong, and then another, and another, and another. Lindner takes the 14-foot killer croc back to the beach. It's missing much of its right front leg and a chunk of its snout has been ripped away. Could these handicaps have been a factor in its attack on Isabel von Jordan? Brendan, this picture here, this is the actual snout of the animal that attacked her. One thing you can see here, it's had the front of its snout bitten away. And I have this graphic here showing what this crocodile looked like. Is that more than usual, the amount of body you would see above water? Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, normally you would just see the what we call the cranial table here, just the, the top of the snout uh, and uh, you know the eyes and the ears, and that's all you would see. Uh, but because of the condition of this animal, it had to keep its snout up, up really high and uh, obviously made it a much more visible animal. You know, if it, if it can't sneak up on, on prey and get kills, it's, you know, it's, it's obviously going to start starving. And it was, it was, it was extremely skinny. Uh, it may have resorted to just about attacking anything it could, just, uh, you know, in the hopes that it actually could you know, get, get a meal and, and make it through. One mission is accomplished, but now Ranger Gary Lindner has another task. 
finding the body of Isabel von Jordan. But where did the croc let go of its victim? Lindner decides to return to the place where he cast the first harpoon. So I, I thought immediately that's probably the most likely spot that it would have dropped Isabel because it suddenly it's worried about its own survival. It's gone from being predator to prey or the hunter to the hunted. And as it turned out, that sort of guess, yeah, it turned out right. We went back and Isabel was lying almost immediately at the site where we first harpooned it. The damaged crocodile had taken her nearly two miles, searching for a quiet place to feed, away from the other, healthier crocodiles in the billabong. When Lindner finds her, the wounds on Isabel von Jordan are remarkably minor. What can you say about uh, the kind of injury she sustained in that initial bite? Well, it's a, it's a little tricky. In, in, a, in a strange sense, it's a relatively protected area of the body, and, and you know we have vital organs that live underneath here, but our ribs are really there to help protect us. Because she was pulled under the water, held under the water, uh, she died from drowning. But who was really responsible for the death of Isabel von Jordan? A reptile? Or a human? The question is decided in a Darwin courtroom five months later. The surviving backpackers serve as witnesses for the prosecution against the man charged with criminal negligence. The tour guide, Glenn Robles. Robles was no beginner. He had been leading tours in Northern Australia for 15 years. He spent three years piloting a crocodile viewing boat in Kakadu. The young people had reason to believe that they were in good hands. We trusted him 100% and I felt that he had the safety of the group at heart. He was the one who took them swimming every day and guided them past the crocodile warning signs. The signs were there, but we trusted the guide. Our guide was our guide and he knew where we could go, where we couldn't go, where we could swim, where we couldn't swim. We put our, all of our trust in our guide. On the fatal night, he suggested the billabong. Drove the backpackers to the beach and checked for crocodiles. And of course, uh, using a torch isn't a bad method of uh, finding out if crocodiles are there, but of course it doesn't give you a 100% uh, result. Yeah. Well, it tells you if they are there, but it certainly doesn't tell you if they're not there. Yeah, well, the crocodile may be underwater, the crocodile may uh, have its back yeah. towards the light, but it won't pick them up. I look back now and, yeah, I mean, it's not a very good way of checking, but like I said, I, I've never been to that sort of place before. He's a guy that works there. If he tells me that's how they do it, I, I don't know any different. I'm not going to argue with the guy. Forty yards away, at the entrance to the beach area, a sign forbids swimming because of crocodiles. Glenn Robles was the first one in the water. He made us feel at ease because he was the first person in. He was so relaxed and so confident that the area was safe. And then we just followed by example. Robles wasn't even there when Isabel von Jordan was taken. There is no way you can blame Isabel, there's no way you can blame any member of the group for what happened that night. The responsibility for me lies solely with Glenn. He's got to deal with it. Everyone who was there has got to deal with it. 
In the end, Robles pleads guilty to charges that his actions had caused her death. And he makes a stunning admission. He had known crocodiles frequented the billabong, but thought it was safe because he believed he had seen Aboriginal people swimming there years before. Court records reveal what Robles told detectives about the incident. I don't know why. There just simply wasn't any reason why. I just did it. Because it was very, very, very hot. You know, sweaty. And you know, it would be really refreshing. And I think that water was very, you know, it was very inviting. The court hands Robles a three-year suspended sentence. The former guide does not serve any time in jail. We may venture into the wilderness and entrust our lives to those who claim to understand the risks. But even experts can sometimes reach too far and lead the innocent traveler across the line from being the hunter to being the hunted. <laughs>